um, comments in now or yeah. okay now okay right um, so a uh, very warm welcome uh, to everyone um, both present here in person and also and also jo those joining us um, online welcome to our Indonesia study group hosted by Indonesia uh, in the ANU Indonesia project um, and Ivanisa I'll be chairing this seminar today um, and uh, we'll and also, please allow me to uh, begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, from whose traditional lands the ANU campus rests, and pay our respect to the elders past and present. Um, we'll kick off uh, our today's seminar by hearing from our esteemed uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Sherlock, following uh, his 45-minute presentation. We will open um, the floor for uh, uh, questions, a Q and a Q Q and a session for 45 minutes. And um, this is a hybrid event. So we will be taking questions from those uh, in the room and also online and those joining us online. Please write your questions in the Q and A chat box um, and we will read them out. Um, and I would also like to remind you this, this is recorded, right? Yeah, I would also like to remind you that um, this seminar is uh, recorded for future viewing. So uh, please be aware of that. Okay, um, now um, it is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Stephen Sherlock. So Dr. Stephen Sherlock is a visiting fellow at the Department of Political and Social Change um, here at ANU. Um, he's also a consultant on political governance and uh, former director of the Center for Democratic Institutions, CDI at ANU, specializing in legislators and electoral issues, including the participations of women in politics, as um, he will be uh, uh, presenting um, his talk on this issue too. Um, so Dr. Sherlock will be presenting this, afterno this afternoon on slowly but surely the effects of electoral quotas on women's candidacy and representation in Indonesia. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Sherlock. Thank you very much for that welcome, Eva. Right, okay. Now, this paper is long overdue in getting public hearing, I must say. I wrote it about three years ago, and COVID and various other excuses I've got intervened. And I'm getting worried that events were going to overtake it. Indeed, they've already started to overtake it with this year's election, because I'm looking at um, the elections from 1999 to 2019. And originally, uh, and still, the title of the paper is Slowly But Surely, the effects of electoral quotas on women's candidacy and representation in Indonesia. I'm beginning to think maybe I might make it a bit less ambitious, or a bit less confident in my title and say, well, it's effective over time, which is sort of a semi-quote from the literature on the impact of uh, women's electoral quotas. But we shall see. So a little bit more then about um, what I'm going to say the origins and objectives of the study, look at the international literature on quotas in which I frame my argument, of course, also in terms of the debate on the effectiveness of quotas in Indonesia. Then look at the what evidence there is. And this is really an, uh, an attempt to explore what evidence there is about the uh, quota, the effects of the quota on party behaviour. And then evidence of the effects of the quota on the behavior of voters. And I would conclude, if I have time, um, at talking a little bit about some of the views about women's representation that I gathered during the course of my research. Because uh, this paper comes out of a much larger study that I did for a DFAT funded project on women's political participation called MAMPU, some of you may be familiar with it. And the issue is sort of, this, this paper is a side, an offshoot really of that uh, because of certain questions that arose during the course of my research and which uh, intrigued me 
This larger research was about the experience of women CSOs in engaging with Parliament and strategies that they could develop. But during the course of that research, I constantly came across this debate about DPR representation, women's representation in the DPR. Has there been progress or has it been a failure? A lot of debate around this, kept on coming back to it in the course of the interviews. In particular, a debate about the effectiveness or not of the 30% quota, which I'll explain later. Now, <clears throat> the methodology for the larger study was semi-structured interviews with around 50 DPR, DPR and DPR B candidates uh, took place in 2018 and in 2019. Interviews with about 10 male and female party leaders. And then there are a whole lot of interviews, semi-structured interviews and informal interactions over the course of several months with activists in CSOs and uh, within academia. And then a, a quantitative data, which I gathered uh, from CSOs and academics. And that data is largely what is the, the focus of this paper in the context of the literature on quotas, both international and Indonesian. Okay, well, this essentially is the issue. This is the starting point. If we look at women's representation in the DPR, in the Indonesian Parliament, the picture is quite interesting. It looks like generally steady progress, starting at a very low figure of 8.6% in the first democratic election in 1999, increasing by three percentage point then by um, what was it, seven percentage point a dip in 2014, but then the increase uh, continuing again in um, 2019. It will be interesting to see what it is in 2014. My hunch is that it will be a little bit higher, but not much higher, but that's a condition. Okay, so this is the question. Why? Why has women's representation in the DPR increased? Now, this is a particularly pertinent question because, um, well, let's go through what I'm saying here, just pointing out that it's more than doubled over that time. And this is equal to the average for Asia. Yeah, I mean, that's a bit of a picking a useful figure, but it's a comparable figure. Uh, the global figure is somewhat higher. But Indonesia is, one could argue, approaching the global average. So it's not such a bad picture. But this is the but. But most of the literature on women's representation in Indonesia stresses the problems, the barriers, the obstacles, why it's so difficult for women to stand in elections, why it's so difficult for them to win representation if they get representation to get powerful positions in the parliament. So that's what most of the literature stresses. In particular, overall negative attitudes towards uh, women's participation in public life. Um, Sally and Ed and um, the first name of Sabarani did a uh, very, very interesting work on that. And other literature emphasizes the opposition to women's involvement within political parties. Others, like uh, Prihatini's work, talks about the marginalization of women within legislatures, even if they do manage to get elected. So how then do we explain this increase? If the overall picture of societal and political scene seems to be so negative for women's representation, why have we seen this increase? If there are so many obstacles, uh, have the quotas, that's the other variable, have the quotas played a role in facilitating a greater representation for women? And can we find evidence for this? And my argument is that there is some very tentative evidence in the data that I'm about to present. So first of all, <clears throat> let's look at the literature on quotas and some of the themes of that. And I'm emphasizing the themes that are important for the framing of my argument. First of all, we need to point out that there is a massive literature on this topic across the world. 
huge literature. I don't pretend to have read it all or even a large percentage of it, but I did do a lot of reading for this uh, paper. And one that has that did strike me uh, was the one by Hughes Packwood, Hughes, Baxter, and Cook. And one point that all of the literature makes, or most of the literature makes, is the importance of contextualization. That if you want to understand the effects of quotas, you need to put them within the societal context. They'll work in some places more than others, according to a range of different things. And Dalarup and Freidenthal argued that quotas were most successful where women were long accepted in public life, where women already were accepted in public life, for example, in countries in the EU or North America. So but this raised the question then, did the quotas actually make any difference? Would women's representation have increased despite that? They uh, make the argument that we shouldn't regard it as some sort of silver bullet. They didn't use that word, but it's something to that effect. It's not a silver bullet. And yes, they need to, we need to ask the question, will they work? in circumstances where societal attitudes seem to be running against or obstructing, blocking women's representation. The other important theme of the literature is the importance of electoral systems. The quotas have different effects according to the electoral system that is operating in any particular assembly. Quotas interact with the electoral system. Now, PR, proportional representation, which we have in our setup in Australia and is um, in the DPR, where multi-member districts with parties getting representation roughly according to the percentage of their vote, that is generally seen as more favourable to women. Quotas or not, PR generally tends to favour uh, women and minority groups as well. That's international finding. And some scholars argue that this also applies to quotas. That is, that quotas within PR systems have more effect. Now, some other studies dispute the universality of this conclusion. They don't argue that there is a trend, but that it's not always the case. And those studies highlight variables within electoral systems, such as high district magnitude. In other words, if you have a large number of seats within a district, then it's you require a smaller percentage of vote to win a seat. High district magnitude electorates tend to be more favorable to women's representation, whereas ones with low district magnitude, like many seats in the DPR with only three members, it's quite difficult for women to be elected statistically. And closed versus open list. PR systems also makes a difference. The argument being that open list system where voters have the uh, opportunity to vote for a candidate uh, as well as a party or instead of a party, open list system tends to be more favorable to women's representation. And really critically, of course, is whether or not there are requirements on the rank order within PR systems. In other words, what is your position on the party list? If you're at number one on the party's list, you are much more likely to be elected if you, than if you're two and three. And we'll be talking quite a lot uh, about that. <clears throat> and for example, a so-called zipper list system, where uh, it is a requirement that there be uh, alternation of gender, male, female, male, female, or female, female, male, etc. That also um, has a big impact. <clears throat> the other uh, aspect of this, which really flows on from that argument, emphasizes the importance of quota design. Trent Bayer argued it's not simply having a quota, but how the institution is designed. That is how the, the quota as an institution is designed that increases women's representation. It's now accepted that the details of design are critical. And the, the literature also emphasizes the need for sanctions, need for uh, 
sanctions for non-compliance, both on parties and on candidates. If it's left voluntarily, voluntary, then it's it's far weaker in its effect. And placement requirements. This point, the requirement of having some 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 legislative or regulatory requirement about where women and men are placed is also critical to outcomes. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at when we start looking at the data. Okay, with more seats, favorable placement on party lists in PR. Then finally, the other theme in the literature is the importance of political parties as gatekeepers. In other words, the people who are the ones allowing women into positions of candidacy or blocking their entry. And in particular, there's the issue of the, the spirit with which quotas or some other measures are implemented. If they are implemented by party leadership purely to meet the administrative requirements, purely just to meet the legislation, then it's far likely uh, to be influential than if the party leaders embrace the idea of women's representation, follow the rules and maybe even uh, exceed them. Because parties reflect, I should say parties rather than just they, parties reflect societal attitudes. In other words, they, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're influenced by society's attitudes as well, but they have a capacity, parties have a capacity to lead change. To lead change through their own internal party culture and their practices. For example, um, supporting and um, trying to bring out uh, encourage women leaders. And then, of course, the quality on women candidates. I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the argument about so many women candidates in Indonesia being drawn from already existing powerful families. And voters, of course, note these things. So low quality, if I can use that term, women's candidates, of course, going to attract fewer votes than if you have women candidates that are experienced, that have high profile, and so forth. And all of that is up to the political parties. They decide, they may be uh, directed to have a certain number of women candidates, but it's up to them to decide which candidates, the actual individuals. And of course, their, their placement on party lists sends messages to the voters. If all the women are just on number three position, because that's the most that they can, or the least that they can do, it sends a message to voters that, well, you know, these candidates are not necessarily serious. So voters are likely to respond to that. And the promotion of candidates, women candidates during the campaign itself, whether they're well resourced, whether they're highlighted in propaganda and so forth. Ah, now this is the final point. And that is that special measures, quotas, are effective over time. That we cannot expect to introduce some sort of quota and then see an immediate effect in the next election. Long-term long change will only happen uh, over time. And the particularly influential study that I saw, particularly influential for me, was this very large longitudinal study of quotas in 145 countries from 1990 to 2010. And they concluded that quotas are increasingly effective when measured over time. In other words, we need to be patient. And they noted that in many of their case studies, Quotas were initially apparently ineffective, but they came in, became more effective over time, particularly if the requirements for the quotas were ratcheted upwards. And I'll return to that phrase a number of times in this presentation. We have no time is getting on. Okay, so quickly, on the debate and quotas in Indonesia, we see a sense of disappointment with slow progress. Often there seems to be an expectation that because there are 30% quotas, we should have 30% representation of women. My argument is that that's unrealistic. Okay. 
Now, there are positive assessments. Uh, Pradhana and Pullman argued that the election results highlight the success of quotas. But other negative assessments, by uh, Prihatini, for example, argued that quotas had not delivered expected outcomes. But as I suggested, part of the problem with that is that the expected outcome often is 30%. I just don't think that's realistic um, in the short term. And after the 2009 election, where there was actually a big increase in the number of women represented, as I showed in that graph, they argued that quotas will not bring about significant political change, which seemed to be a bit counter to what was happening at that time. Okay, reliance on domestic candidates. Now, this is my argument. Employing the argument or framing my argument within the, the uh, what's argued in the literature, that international experience shows that quota effects must be measured over time, especially when there is ratcheting up of targets. And considering the importance of quota design in the context of a given electoral system, Indonesia's PR system. Um, yeah, uh, and, and also noting the fact that quotas are most effective with placement mandates and enforcement mechanisms. And that's two important points that do exist in Indonesia. Placement mandates, that is the one in three rule, that you have to have one female candidate for each three, and there are enforcement mechanisms. So noting that, I argue that the history of quotas in Indonesia accords with international experience, as I've shown here above, and shows a correlation, a correlation between strengthening quotas and increased women's representation. As the quotas become more and more stringent, so women's uh, representation has increased. So there's a pretty uh, strong evidence there just from the correlation between these two trends. But is there some evidence of causation that one has caused the other? And I argue that there is some evidence. It's not overwhelming evidence, but I want to show that, point that as evidence in the time that I've got, but um, that shows that the changes by in party behavior in relation uh, there is evidence of changes in party behaviour in relation to the recruitment and the placement of women candidates. All right, so what is the evidence, such as it is? I kept that important graph there so that I don't have to keep referring back to it. And what is the history of quotas in Indonesia? 1999, first democratic election, no quota. Closed list PR. Note that, importance of the electoral system. 2004, parties were encouraged to have 30% of the people on their ticket, uh, women. Now, there was no, there was no compulsion. Uh, they just must give consideration, pratimbana, to including women. But even that very, very mild measure is correlated with, it suggested that it worked because there was a 3%, 3 percentage point increase between 1999 and 2004. In 2009, the 30% quota became obligatory and it became obligatory within the context now of an open list system, which if you remember, I said a few moments ago, tends statistically internationally to be more advantageous to women the closed list PR. And a semi zipper system for the party list was introduced. I call the semi, -zip, uh, semi zipper or the one in three, which means that one, two, three candidates, one of those three has to be a woman. And quite important, although often ignored in the in the discussion, is the fact that DPP are now required to have 30% uh, women's representation. And in some of the qualitative interviews that I did, a lot of women saw that as quite important. And then in 2014, the KPU introduced regulations itself to enforce 
quota compliance in every electoral district. So in every Dubbil, 30% of candidates had to be women. It's not good enough just to have 30% as a national, national average, but that in every single Dubbil. And that's an important point too, because um, special measures for women don't have to necessarily be in the form of legislation. They can be regulations by electoral management bodies or a range of other things. Then in 2019, there was a legislative requirement uh, to meet, basically to, to fulfil the copy of regulation, that you have to have women representatives 30% in every single electric district, not just on the national average. Okay, the, the, the implicit approach behind this, and this is implicit, it's not always argued like this, but this is how I see it. it this approach of these quotas aims to change party behaviour. It, it puts requirements on the political parties in their candidacy. And through that, to influence voters to elect more women candidates. That's basically the strategy, as I see it. But, first of all, party behaviour. Have the quotas changed party behaviour? The things that part, political party leaderships, the gatekeepers actually do. Now, the strongest evidence on that, um, of the positive effects of quotas, is just the increase in women candidates since 20, 2004. And I've got a graph next that will uh, indicate that. <clears throat> In 2004, 32% of women, of candidates were women, just simply through the force, the apparent force of moral pressure. In 2009, that figure increased to 33%. When the candidate uh, quota became obligatory, semi-zipper system was introduced and the party board quota was introduced. Then in 2014, 37% of all candidates were women. And the change that happened was that the couple of regulations uh, made it more stringent. Then in 2019, there were 40% of all candidates were women. And in that case, legislation enforced compliance in every electoral district. And we can see these uh, figures here. So 33, 37, 40%. But note, note this figure here, which I'll talk about in a moment. The number of votes to women candidates only increased by one percentage point each election. That's a quite an important point. Now, the evidence for positive change in party behaviour is less clear when it comes to the placement behaviour. There is this global issue of women being put in unwinnable seats or in low in the party list. And in all of the elections I've looked at, many more women, as many more men, I'm sorry, than women were in list position one. 1,000 versus 300 in 2019. And the number of candidates elected from that number one position, that key powerful number one position, 308 men and only 57 women. A similar sort of uh, proportion for number two. And it's only when we get to number three position that we see roughly equal numbers of men and women being elected. And the numbers are quite small, as you see. And, and I'll talk about this in a moment, the percentage of candidates elected from the number one position, 60% of men who were elected were elected from number one position, whereas only 48% of women who were in the number one position were elected. As I said, I'll come back to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Many interviewees just said, well, the parties are just following the administrative requirement. I heard that phrase so many times. They're just doing the minimum. Okay, so here are the figures here in graph form. Uh, shows it very dramatically. The, the number of men there in purple who are uh, who were elected from the number one position versus number of women. Am I going for time? About 10 minutes? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, I think I'll see you on that. Just clarification, which Darby is this? Which, sorry? Which electoral areas? That's national. 
a copy of these copies of the yeah, yeah I, I thought that too, but when you add that up, it gets up to 560. Anyway, I've been talking about that one. Um, okay, so the next, um, that's the number of people elected, not number of candidates. Now, um, this is a quite complicated uh, piece of work, which Bill then did. I can't take credit for it. And I'll come back to it later. But what it's, what it's shown here is the number of male candidates in each of the respective positions and the number of female candidates in each of the in all of each of the respective positions just to introduce it first and then what i've concluded that from that is there is some positive evidence of the effect of the three in one rule the parties only did the necessary, the, the minimum necessary to comply with the legislation. Thus, we see the number of men on positions one to three progressively decreases. So it's a big number for one, smaller number for number two, smaller number again for number uh, men at number three. Whereas for women, it's quite the opposite. The number of women at position number one is low. More at number two, more at number three. That's the actual numbers. But this to me is the key point. I was quite struck at this when I started looking at it. But the number of men on position four increased. So therefore, what that statistic shows is that the rule did force some parties to make placement decisions that disadvantaged some prospective male candidates. And the reality of, of this is that we are going to have more women's representation. Some men have to lose out. You know, all, players, all players don't win a prize in this. Parties are going to have to make hard decisions that disadvantage some male candidates. And there we see evidence of that actually happening. Maybe a very modest change. But the men were, a small number of men were pushed into is unfavorable number four position as a result of the quota. And here's the figure. One, two, three. And then suddenly the number of men at number four goes up. Arguably, many of those men would have been in number three had the quota rule not been in operation. <clears throat> okay, so in summary, for party behaviour, over time, the quotas progressively increased the total number of women candidates, forced parties to bunch women candidates at position number three, which is not great, much better if they are two at one, but they were in number three position, which is a sort of winnable position, better than four or five or six. And this pushed out some prospective male candidates from position into position number four. And this accords with international findings that ratcheting up requirements work, but only over time. Okay, changing voter behaviour, however. Have quotas made any uh, observable change to the way in which voters behave, to the way in which they vote? The proposition is that quotas will change party behaviour, which will then change voter behaviour. But as I said, the literature shows that quotas are most effective when political and social conditions are conducive. So given the opportunity to vote for women, and there has been increasing opportunity with more and more women candidates, how many voters will actually do so, actually vote for women? As I show here, this table here shows that not as many voters as one might have hoped were voting for this increased number of women candidates. There is a lag, a lag between the increasing voter candidates and the increasing number of votes going to women. As I've shown, the women are generally placed on lower lists. But another important piece of evidence here is that even if women are placed at number one, they still tend to perform less well than men when placed at number one. If you see in 2019, 30% of um, men were elected from position one, one whereas only 24% of successful female candidates were elected from position one. 
So it seems that the advantage of being number one does not universally, does not always compensate for the apparent disadvantage of being a female. And that's, that's the data which I'm drawing from there. Showing, you see here, that even if a woman is on position number one, they're still less likely to be elected than a male on position number one. So I'm down. Right. Now, the, the usual, and I'm not say usual, it makes it sound dismissive, the, the, the most widespread argument about the unwillingness of voters to support women are uh, focused on cultural factors. A dreadful word, but let's just keep for, for the moment. And um, Sally and Ed's work um, shows some of that, although they were focusing in particular on attitudes towards women in public life as the final member. But there's, it's a complicated thing, I think, to understand what exactly are we talking about when we talk about cultural factors. Because as Sally and Ed argued, whether these views, that is views that did not favour women's involvement in public life, mean that uh, how that influences voting is less clear. And as a um, certain number, a large amount of literature shows, that apparently conservative Islamic attitudes to the position of women do not necessarily uh, form uh, a barrier to women's candidacy, including as uh, Prihatini has shown, even within, there's no uh, direct correlation between whether or not a party is an Islamic party and its uh, level of women's representation. In other words, Islamic parties rep have women's representation or candidacy about the same as the nationalist parties. Other important thing we need to be aware of, I think, um, I'm running out of time, but I think I can talk about this, is the importance of regional differences. But there are long-term attitudinal differences between different regions, which has an effect on the way in which people will vote or not vote for women. For example, there is a clustering of high level of support for women candidates in the northern provinces of Sulawesi and in North Morocco. The votes for women in 2019 in North Sulawesi were 43%, and North Morocco 43% as well. We're getting towards half. That's the number of votes, not number of candidates elected, the votes for women candidates. Three of the four seats in both those provinces were won by women. But this, of course, is a historical thing. It's not something that has just happened in one election. There is a long-standing uh, cultural feature that has led people in those provinces to be supportive of women in public life and to vote for women, as Margaret showed in her study, including in the DPRV in Minahasa, where a majority of voters voted for women candidates. On the other hand, very low support for women candidates in Bali, Aceh, Papua, Kalimantan. And that's a long-standing feature, long-standing characteristic. And this is despite abundant women candidates being on to, available to be chosen. In the case of West Papua, 45%, well above the national average. And there is that uh, evidence that um, Ed and Sally showed of people voting around candidate, uh, women candidates in Bali. So male candidates one and two would get fairly high. The woman on three, very, very low. The male candidate on four. So there's actually, some voters actually consciously avoiding voting for women candidates by, by some of these arguments. Okay, so regional differences are very, very important. I'll skip over this if I don't have the time. Okay, very, very quickly then, if I've got a few minutes left. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. This is not, this is sort of indirectly relevant, but uh, this is some of the views of women's, women candidates about the issue of women representation and why people will or will not vote for women and some of their strategies. Some normative issues. <laughs> Expected views that I heard that Many people, many voters think the politics is for men only. Public life is not appropriate for women. But many people said that um, there's particular issues related 
for their local group. One women, woman I remember saying that her suku was patrilineal. It was even bad for a woman to be seen entering into a hotel. So she emphasized not so much the gender issue, but a particular attitudes in her local area. And this is the one I love. Aranya, uh, Aran, Mikia, Romanya Pasti, Brantaka. If you're a woman politician, you know, you're, you're a bad wife, you're a bad housewife, you're a bad mother. Your house must be a total mess if you're involved in politics. People, uh, this one particular woman uh, said that. And this is what people think. She get, encounters that all the time, she said. Um, but in, related to, in relation to that point above, often many of the, the women I invented, uh, interviewed um, said that their local characteristics, their local suku or their aliran were more important than their gender. In other words, I remember one woman saying to me, you know, I'm from an Enu background. There's no way in the world I'm going to stand uh, for election in a Mohammedia area. That's far more important about than my gender. So I thought that was an interesting observation. And then there's a number of what I've called instrumental issues, and I'll finish on that. Many of the women candidates I interviewed said, many people think, well, yeah, I've got no objection in voting for women, but what can women do for us? Men control the networks. They're the people who can bring the benefits to our community. And that chimes in with that point about voters seeing that the women are only on position number three or four or whatever, it's then they get a message that you know, they're the marginal candidates. The women are the marginal candidates. That's the perception. And that's what women candidates are fighting against. But a number of women told me stories about how they, in their experience, if they could just get their foot in the door, then they could improve their uh, vote over time. But people started to respect what the uh, women representatives were able to do once they actually got into power. If they proved themselves, they could get a high vote. Okay. Now, there are many candidates, women candidates, who I interviewed, who generally agreed with the stereotyped, if I can put it that way, attitudes about the role of women, focused on family issues, social welfare issues, but for them, that's not a problem because they thought they argued that this meant that they could achieve things for women if they were in office. And as um, Sally and Ed all uh, pointed out, one of the main ways in which women have um, mobilised and campaigned is through uh, their support within women's organisations. So they use their gender as a strength rather than it being a weakness. Very, very common thing too, that women can enter spaces that are considered to be inappropriate for men, and that can be a real strength. In Adyan especially, so many of my inter interviewees mentioned that. That's, that's one of the places where I do a lot of my campaign. So, okay, very quickly, conclusion, the international experience indicates the effectiveness of quotas over time, especially where it gradually ratcheted up including placement mandates and enforcement mechanisms. All of that has happened in Indonesia. The Indonesian experience reflects this trend. It has been a gradual increase in women's representation as quotas have been progressively strengthened, especially uh, placement mandates, the one in three rule and the enforcement uh, mechanisms. The, the main challenge is that this has not been accompanied by a major increase in votes for women. There has been an increase in votes for women, but it has not kept up with the increase in the number of uh, women candidates. The challenge of societal uh, attitudes and the voter, voter behaviour is changing more slowly than party behaviour. But nevertheless, my conclusion is that there are grounds for optimism on women's representation. After all, the number has doubled over the last five elections. Now that's nothing to be completely uh, pessimistic about, it seems to me. So it seems to me uh, that what I've argued here is that there is evidence that advocacy for incremental change can bring results. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, uh, Pat Stephen, um, for uh, such a wonderful talk and yeah, for sharing your expertise, delivering such a uh, insightful talk today. And now I'd like to open up uh, the floor to questions from audience. Um, and um, we are taking questions from those in the room and also online. Um, we're taking questions from yeah, uh, Alan and then um, uh, Pat Tony and one yeah. Yeah, so three questions first. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I come and then um, back on. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so uh, that was very interesting. And I'm just wondering about um, who are the proponents of quota regulation? Um, because taking a select a view of the digital politics, so I'm wondering. To what extent personalities and respect for those personalities as chief colleagues, what kinds of things that person uh, is respecting the colleagues? Um, if, if, so, yes, could you say a little bit more who it is? I didn't quite understand the second part of the question and how it related to the first part. So, uh, so, who are the people advocating and what was the second part? So, what kind of respect? Uh, do parties have for those kind of people that is it fair for the people that have a political impression of votes? That's a good question. Um, and it's not one that I have done research exclusively on. Um, my my first response is well, the people who are advocating for it are uh, women's organizations, uh democratic democratic promotion uh, organizations. Are there are people, there's something you're cursing to say, I can say. Yes, so I, mean, I mean the people who were actually in charge of, like- Within the parties. Within, no, so like, who, who is it that is responsible for quota regulation? Oh, I see what you meant. A uh, couple you. Right. Which is one of the disappointing things that's happened in this election, right. is that the couple you has been much more lax in the enforcement of the 30% rule. So the company wasn't responding to some kind of power broker? Well, it's responding to the legislation. I mean, it's guided by the legislation, but of course, as we know, any bureaucratic body uh, works within certain parameters set by, by that legislation, and it can interpret it and enforce it in different ways. And the CUPA in, in 2014 uh, decided itself that it was going because but Hadar was there, was in the company at that time. Um, you know, very, very well known and respected uh, democracy advocate, very leading role in the company. So he was able to influence the company to introduce regulations that um, provided for the enforcement of the 30% rule in every single DAP bill. Whereas this couple, which Hadar and other people tell me is a much more one one which is much more amenable to the influence of government, shall I put it that way. And they have failed uh, to actually to implement the legislation because they, they took, don't want to go into technicalities, but basically they took the position that where you couldn't come up with a precise 30% or more number, they would round it down so that 28% or 25% counted as 30%. So the way they interpreted it, just a, a mathematical procedure uh, influenced the outcome. Right. I think that's sort of getting at your question, isn't it? Kind of. Maybe everything plays a problem, so I better somebody else throw it in. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Stephen. That was very interesting, but arguably it could have been much more interesting <laughs> if we were there to think that it made any difference. For the men or women who are elected. Um, well, I mean, that's it, another it, issue. It would seem, in general, in read all this literature, but I've lived a long time. And in, in, um, in the early phase of this process that you are chronicling, mostly it doesn't make any difference to the way parties behave and so forth. But there comes a time, and because you know, women have to behave much like men in order to get ahead and, and so forth. Uh, and people's expectations are important. 
but it seems to come a time in some countries and we're very conscious of it in Australia because it just happened rather dramatically that those teal candidates were almost entirely women uh, because I think um, they wanted to say this system sucks the, the sort of alpha male you know contestation is is, is out of hand and um, we, we want to talk about a new kind of politics which is heavy on propriety and uh, honesty and greenness and the environment uh, and i think i'm right saying in in scandinavia it's been something similar in germany that uh, women have tended to be much more prominent in green or otherwise reforms that really want to change the system now can you uh, am i right in thinking that Indonesia doesn't really have any reforms countries like yeah that. but i mean if it did that or it may have in the future may they be Remembering. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't disagree. That's a key point. And in the literature, uh, you're probably aware, there's very uh, important uh, differentiation drawn between the issue of nominal women representation, just the numbers, and substantive women representation, which is what you're getting at, the quality of women candidates and what they're actually able to do. But that's not what this paper is about. No, I was purely looking at the evidence that the quotas had increased that the correlation between increasing effectiveness of quotas and increasing uh, women's representation was causally connected now but taking up your example of the australian case i would see that as a very good example of how quotas and regulations make a huge difference in this case the quota was not a legislative one like in indonesia what i'm referring to is the voluntary quota that the Labor Party introduced of having 30% of all its candidates in winnable seats. That was something which was introduced in the 1990s. And it had, over, over time, this is a critical thing, a dramatic effect on the number of women candidates standing for the Labor Party and a dramatic effect on the number of women representing the Labor Party in the parliament, 50%. Of women, 50% uh, of Labor Party members in the Senate and the House of Representatives in the last election and in this election are women. Whereas the Liberal Party had no such quota. They talked about targets. Yes, this is a nice thing. We've got a target of so and so. As a result of that, in the last parliament, I don't know the figures of this parliament, last parliament, whereas 50% of Labor Party members were women, 24% of Liberal National Party. Uh, members were women. And that is part or major of the origin of the Teals. They were women because uh, they were concerned about the right wing drift of the Liberal Party, but they are also extremely angry about the exclusion of women from positions of influence within the Liberal Party. And one manifestation of that and one instrument of that was the non existence of quotas in the Liberal Party compared to the Labour Party. And it's something that's very, very rarely ever talked about. The Labour Party doesn't get enough credit, I think. And people talk about women's lack of representation in Parliament. Well, it's not true, actually, as a, as a well, it is true on average. But if you look more closely, you can see that it's a party matter. And what's been crucial has been the quota in the Labour Party. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Wanda, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, I have a question about the effectiveness of the gender quota exam because, like, uh, compared with the neighbor countries in Indonesia, like, for example, in, in, I think most of the country only Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and the nation like that, Philippines use the gender quota, but their uh, repressiveness is still lower compared with the Singapore and, and Vietnam. So, the effectiveness of the gender quota in Indonesia still have a uh, question until now. And the second is actually I, I, I also agree the placement of the party is also affect the uh, win of the woman because and I compare in 2014 and answer to not saying and I mostly women in the number one and number three is getting elected and yeah. the in the parliament. But the, the parliament the, the power of getting it on the party list is in the political party. Absolutely. So the system inside the political party is the the, the, the one that getting affected. And 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 the political party also choose 
the women that are getting the number one is mostly like the incumbent, like the the the, the one that they they're making sure he he will get a uh, vote in the parliament. So until it is also happened in uh, 2024. And uh, in 2019, only Nasdem that have more than 30 percent women that uh, 30 percent women in the parliament. So is it how how and you know, according to you how and uh, political party can change the uh, 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 regulation internal in the internal and your party itself? Well, the how is very simple in technical terms. They just simply have to make a decision to do it. But the the well, actually making that happen is a political issue, of course, and it has to be a struggle within the political parties. But one point that I just made very, very briefly, a couple of women that I interviewed um, said that the 30% quota of women in the MPP actually makes a difference. And that has enabled them to be, as I put it, um, I remember one woman in particular say, being taken more seriously as a result of that. So um, perhaps, and I haven't actually even thought about this, but in the course of thinking in response to your question, perhaps that's where a new frontier should be opened up in advocacy is to in, in, introduce compulsory measures within political parties. How effective they would be, I don't know, but the compulsory 30% on political party boards seems to have had some effect, some qualitative effect. But I mean, everything you're saying, I couldn't disagree with. It, it's critically important. Placement on party lists is critically important because despite the theory of open list that it gives people the chance to vote for their real representatives, the vast majority of people don't even know who are the people on the candidate list. They may know that they want to, for example, vote for PDOP, and I'm thinking about my in-laws right at this very moment, but they had no idea who the candidate in Bakassi was for PDOP. They would just vote number one. So. Unless more uh, women are, I think, are allowed to stand on position number one, progress will be limited. And then it will become uh, an individual fight for women who do manage to get elected on a lower list to show that they're effective and to argue the case uh, to persuade party leaders to get higher on the list. But also just referring to your point about Malaysia, it's about Singapore, and Vietnam, I think your example of what, well, uh, that's the classic examples of how electoral systems influence these things. Vietnam, one party state, one party state can just simply bureaucratically designate X percent of women to be representative. So I think that's an entirely different sort of set of, set of circumstances, which reinforces the point about the importance of political context in, in quotas. And similarly, of course, in the case of Singapore, effectively a one-party state. So you know, it's, it's, shall I say, easier to get those results if the bureaucrats and the parties decide to make these results. Much more challenging in a genuinely democratic environment. So thank you, uh, President. So uh, let's go to the uh, online participants. We have three questions, and uh, Kate will read them out. Yeah. And we'll go back to the um, questions from the room after that. So our questions online have grown quite a bit and they're quite long, so yes. please excuse me for paraphrasing. But the first one I'll mention is from our friend, uh, our dear friend Lolita Marina. Le uh, Lolita wants to know, have you looked at the performance realisation of elected um, female politicians? And in particular, are they bringing up issues that women care about and she wants to you know it would be interesting to know the relationship of the women's quota not only to equality but to development and issues for women yes well this once again is the issue of nominal versus substantive representation what do the women the women who are elected what do they do and what do they do for women um, are they any different from male candidates do they emphasize um, different issues do they approach politics differently? Are they less corrupt? There's a whole range of issues that is addressed in the literature in relation to uh, substantive representation. Um, once again, that's not the object of this paper, but it is certainly an interesting question. 
and it's not one that I have looked at personally, but although I've read the literature on the subject. What, what I would say, though, and mainly reading the work of Elia, Ella uh, Prihatini on this, I mean, she's shown, and it, I mean, it does actually accord with my own research too, that although there is, um, no, let me put it this way, there is a fact that there is an overrepresentation of women in the committee in the DPR that are focused on policy areas that are traditionally seen as women's issues, child welfare, education, health, maybe social welfare issues. There is an overrepresentation, but there's two ways that you can look at that. One is to say, well, this is an example of how women are marginalised from the powerful committee, like committee one and two, looking at foreign affairs and defence and finance and so forth. The other argument that I often heard from my um, research and from Ellis also is that this is related to the fact that many of the women who are being elected to DPR, DPR see themselves as having a particular uh, mission, if you like, to make an impact in those policy areas. So what I'm saying is that you can see it in a positive light or in a negative light, but there is definitely a clear uh, preponderance of women in the the, the committees within the DPR that work on traditional quote unquote women's issues. All good. I'm going to jump to another one from Ella. It's a long one, and it may well be the Ellie that I think you just referred to. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, and there are some predictions that the women's share from this recent election in February may be similar to 2019, yeah. um, about 20%. And the fact that nearly all incumbents have run again for the 2024 elections, it would be interesting to check their re-elect, re-election rate. Right. Yes. Um, and the sense that incumbency may shape the proportion of women in our DPR. Mm -hmm. um, and then she goes on and says that we'd also have a breakdown of the parties with the biggest success in getting their female MPs re-election, re-elected, because sometimes MPs are assigned by their parties to run from different electoral districts. And overall, the quota has been there to increase nomination, yet electability is a different elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. But thanks again, and she looks forward to hearing more and your thoughts yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh I think that's a very important point. And incumbency is certainly an advantage. Whatever the reasons for that, we, we need to detain us. But incumbency is clearly an advantage, which is one of the reasons why um, I'm relatively optimistic about long-term developments, because the number of women being elected has increased. So that means, therefore, there are increasing numbers of women contesting so subsequent elections as incumbents, so long as their parties are nominated, of course. Um, and that appears to be the case, and it will be very interesting to look at the statistics of incumbency on, on a gender basis. But this accords, again, with some of the observations made by my uh, interviewees who made the case, as I said, that if they could get into Parliament, and then could be effective, their experience, and uh, two or three cited these experiences to me, of three elections, their personal vote increasing. If, it, if we can get the number of women whose personal vote is increasing, that increases the chances of the party renominating them, and therefore the chances of them being re-elected uh, from a position of incumbency. I know one very, very interesting story from a, a woman who was actually at the DPRD. I can't remember what province. But anyway, she said to me that the first time she contested the election, she only contested the election to support her brother. She didn't campaign herself at all. She only campaigned for her brother. He was elected in the subsequent election. She obviously became interested or whatever. She said, I started campaigning for myself and then I was elected. So it's a, a clear example, I think, of how the very fact of getting into the political system, getting experience campaigning, can have uh, an advantageous effect for women over the long term. Mm 
once you get this process going, so long as the parties are not obstructing it, then there can be a snowballing effect. And then I'll just ask another one here, and this one's from uh, Lyd, Lydia. Have you seen, is there any evidence, are women more likely to vote for women? <laughs> um, and again, thanks for the presentation, it's fascinating. You got any perspective on this? Are women any more likely to vote for women? I really, I don't know of any work in Indonesia that's been done on that. Um, yeah, so we did find a, a slight gender advantage, so more uh, women more likely to vote for female candidates than men are. Um, but we found that religion had a greater influence than gender. So that what had a greater influence? Religion. Oh, yeah, greater influence absolutely. Than gender. Yes. So, that um, was what I found uh, for my interviews as well. Karen Becker um, in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, yeah, in the yeah. Pacific um, said that uh, not really. Uh, yeah. yeah it's not well, a Karen very really, different yeah. situation there. Yeah. Um, notoriously difficult to get people to vote for women male yeah. in Melanesian societies. Exactly. Which of course is one of the reasons why you get the same phenomenon in Papua, in Indonesian yeah. Papua. Exactly. Also the, the position of women in Melanesian society as a generalization mm -hmm. makes it very, very difficult mm -hmm. for people to respect them in public life, to see them as legitimate players in public life, and therefore to, to get representation. I mean Papua New Guinea for many years has had one or no uh, women members of parliament at all. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, the only woman member of parliament was an expat, a former Australian who became the PNG national. So therefore a whole lot of advantages. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Pat Stephen. Okay, we return to uh, the room. Uh, we do sell. Uh, oh. Uh, sorry, Ms. Helen Sullivan, before you resume. No, sorry. Okay, Ibu Selly and um, Mas Helen. One more for you later, and then we have lots of questions um, online. Thanks, Stephen. Um, just in terms of the way you frame the paper, I don't think that there's anybody out there writing on this who thinks that the quota hasn't had an impact. Mm -hmm. I think it's just assumed that it's had an impact. It's assumed. Yeah, but I mean, it's obvious it, it, that you haven't presented any evidence that's any different from what other people have presented about the impact of the quota. Uh, you know, I think it's quite clear that the quota has made an impact. It's just that when we talk about people being disappointed, it's because we feel like it hasn't had as great an impact as it could have had mm. because there are all of these other constraints in place. And if we just look at purely in terms of the level of, of representation, I mean, yes, it's getting closer to the to the global average, but if we look at the global average of countries that have some kind of a gender quota, and that includes like really, really slack, lax gender quotas, we're, we're way off that. That's like 27, 28%. So I think that's what really drives this disappointment. It's about trying to understand, despite the fact that we have this quota in place, and it's a reasonably strong quota, why isn't it doing better? So I think that I think you need to talk to that kind of aspect of it more in the way that you frame the paper rather than saying it hasn't, you know, rather than saying it's all about showing that the quotas had an impact. Because I think that's actually pretty obvious that the quota has had well, an impact. Um, and then if we look at going forward, I guess we need to think in terms of, I mean, is it really enough to just keep going the way it is? Like, is it business as usual? Will it just continue to improve incrementally if there's no more ratcheting up? And I think I think that you know I think that's an open question at this stage. Mm -hmm. But and it's going to be really interesting to to evaluate on the basis of these current elections because I mean just on the basis of my back of the envelope calculations, the amount of women allocated per spot. By parties has gone down quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. We know that overall candidate numbers have gone down. Yeah. So women candidate numbers have gone down. We know that there's this issue with the Kapi U not enforcing a Supreme Court decision which says that at every single Dapil it has to be at least 30%. Yeah. And they've decided to just completely ignore that. So 
on the one hand, I share your optimism that it will just kind of slowly go up. But on the other hand, I'm worried that actually the signs are going in the opposite direction. Yeah, well, there's there's two things going on, isn't there? There's, there's the inherent momentum of having women candidates, getting elected, showing they can be effective, contesting as incumbent. That's that's an inherent momentum. That that can continue so long as, as I said, the parties don't obstruct it. But then there's a separate issue about what the regulators are doing, and that's um, where the current situation is. Yes, not at all encouraging. And that's that's why I in the paper emphasise the importance not just of the of the legislation, but of the way in which it's implemented by the implementing bodies by the couple. Yeah, I just found it also very interesting the way the parties, I mean, the way they all rushed to not implement the thirty percent when yes. they didn't have to, exactly, and that it was driven by parties in the legislature, big parties in the legislature that were putting pressure on the KPU not to implement this legislation, which yeah. really calls into question the sincerity of parties in their implementation. Oh, absolutely. As I said, they, 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 were only, they only did the minimum yeah. that they could get away with. Yeah. But just doing the minimum they got away with showed it actually had an effect. And um, to your first point, now, you know, at, at, the, at the macro level, there's this clear correlation. What I was trying to do was to ferret out some sort of evidence of how that correlation is working. That's what I was trying to do in the later graphs of showing how the parties were forced to put more women at number three. Even though it's only an incremental thing, but it pushed out a number of uh, male candidates. Yes, yeah, but isn't I mean, if you have a quota that is legislated, then obviously, like that, it's going to have to do that. Yeah. So I, I don't see that that's really evidence. That it's promoting change within the. I mean, they've had to do it. Yeah, it's, that's why. That's why I said. So you don't party, need any effort party behavior. It's just what they are doing. We don't know um, from that those statistics anything about party culture, and other sorts of things like the things that you're referring to in the twenty four election shows how limited the change in party culture has been, which is why I've kept continually said so long as the parties don't obstruct it then the inherent momentum of having an increasing number of uh, women candidates uh, has the potential to maintain an increasing number of incumbents. But, yeah. as you're saying, if the parties decide to obstruct it, if the parties decide to be difficult, if the parties influence the selection process of the Kapa rule, for example, as they do, producing a very low quality Kapa rule from all, uh, you know, all the evidence that I've had, then yes, progress will be stalled. And progress might even go backwards. So, I mean, there's a great number of, of, of factors involved and all of those I've tried to emphasize as important when considering the um, circumstances in which uh, a, a quota is operating. But that if a quota is in operation and it's in, enforced effectively, and then especially if there is some ratcheting up of the regulations, international experience will show that there will be progress. Whether or not that happens in Indonesia or not is another question. Now, what I, what I do say in the paper, having written it way, way back, I say that in for the 2024 election, if we could manage to get a genuine Zippolis system, for example, um, the evidence of the 24, so, so that uh, many more women will put it number two, the evidence of 1990, 2019 that I pointed to, which show the parties forced to put more women in number two, would be advantageous for women. Now, once again, it would them only doing the absolute minimum that they would have to, had to do. Yeah. But even so, it would still increase the number of women yeah. in a more favourable position. So, yeah, without without continuing um, favourable legislative environment and without a continuing favourable administrative environment by the electoral management body, um, yes, we're up against major problems. It's, it's very interesting, uh, the current election, uh, out of 18 participating political party, only one political party meet that 30% um, um, female requirement, which is PKS. So in yeah. all the 84 
uh, electoral districts Oops. Yeah. needs PKS. It's PKS. It's PKS. It's yeah. but, but PKS was worst in terms of putting women in the yeah, first position. That, that, yeah, in terms of class yeah. 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 the major parties. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, come on. Thanks, Eva. And right, so Sally's pretty much asked what was wanted to get up for. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more though about the uh, the actual incentives parties have to adhere to the law um, and to the quote like what what disciplinary mechanisms do uh, does the Carter Bill really have with parties um, to make sure they're enforcing the quota? I'm just thinking back to the Simon Butts presentation well, here a little while ago. Um, about the the, the 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 rule of law maybe being the rule of patronage. Yeah, well, um, to some extent, I just repeat my other answer. It depends upon the KPU and its will to make it happen. If the KPU decides uh, to enforce the legislation and to do it seriously, it has quite a lot of instruments at its disposal. Right. But if it's a weak cup angle, as the current one is, it will decide not to do that. Right. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for example, um, in 2019, or 2014, I can't remember which one. Yes, it, it was the cup angle, as I said, that decided to impose, interpret the legislation to say that parties had to have the 30% quota in every single double. It was the carpet who decided to do that. And the sanction that it applied to the party was that any party that didn't do that would be disqualified in that double. Now that's a serious sanction and that's at the disposal of the carpet you. But of course, you'll only use it if it wants to. And a strong carpet who could do that and could explore all sorts of things. Publication to shame parties various numbers of things that you could do, but only if it has the political will to do it. And it'll only have the political will if uh, it's made up of people who are genuinely committed, as distinct from committed to just doing what the government tells them to do, which is unfortunately the situation now. Unfortunately, absence of strong sanction. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, um, so uh, we'll go back to uh, our online participants, uh, Kate. And it might be a little bit similar to Sally, but Anastasia asked very early on into your presentation. Sorry, Anastasia, I'm just getting to you now, but congratulations, Stephen. Um, based on your research, is there a tendency for nominating women to fill quotas rather than actual representation? And if so, how do we gauge this with past and future elections and how can actual representation be measured? Oh, how can representation be measured? Well, um, as I said, and then all the literature emphasizes the fact that there's two ways to measure it. Uh, nominal representation, just the numbers, um, and then what the what women, uh, what female representatives actually do uh, when they are elected. So I mean, there's, there's two ways uh, in which it can be measured. The second, of course, obviously is much more qualitative, much more a question of opinion and judgment. And as I mentioned before, what some people might judge to be a positive development, that is women having an impact on social welfare issues, might be seen to other people's judgment as an example of the marginalization of women into particular policy areas. So there's all sorts of judgments that are in, involved when it comes to issues of substantive uh, representation. The first part of the question, if I remember correctly, is whether or not women are being made candidates just because in quotas. Well, I'd say absolutely yes. But, but, but my argument there is even though the parties are doing, apparently, the bare minimum, or have in the previous elections, done the bare minimum to meet those regulations, those regulations are actually uh, having an effect. But uh, as we've been talking about, that will only continue if the um, one legislation remains good or uh, is improved in our terms, and if it's uh, implemented in in a way 
uh, that uh, fulfills the spirit of the legislation and is done by uh, administrators who are generally committed to it rather than just committed to doing the, uh, the minimum and letting the parties get away with all sorts of games. Maybe one last question. It's a big one. Oh, okay. They're all big ones. Rob is thinking of it. Thank you, Tanya, for asking your question. Um, she said, look, there's a general, uh, a gentle optimism of the argument seems to be based on what happens on an international level, but the provenance of Euro-America in gender and politics literature can skew during globalizations, which often don't translate well into Indonesia. However, what has changed in Indonesia, given the biggest barriers remain in place, and in particular, the high cost of elections exacerbated by open list systems? Do you have any evidence from the most recent elections that suggests that any of the barriers have decreased and that we're on a path to slow improvements between 2019 and 2024? Well, this is the reason why I gave myself a kick and said, I've got to hurry up and get this paper out there because it's going to be undertaken by events. Uh, because I don't have um, statistics on the 2024 election. Um, but what we do know uh, is just as we've been talking about, the political environment, the, the regulatory environment has changed for the worse. That's one thing we do know. Um, it would be a much larger project of the sort that Sally and Ed and so forth have done to measure societal changes, whether um, people's attitudes um, to women's representation has changed, particularly in those areas where it's traditionally been um, so difficult. That was a, was a much bigger project, and I certainly don't have any evidence on that. But we do know one thing, that is that the regulatory environment has deteriorated. So I'm just a bit conscious of the time. We are running a bit of time. So um, I would like to invite you all to um, join me thanking uh, Pat Stephen. Thank you so much, Pat Stephen. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Indonesia Project, uh, for organizing the uh, seminar. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you.